Hello students, so up until uh, previous class we concluded uh, chaos theory uh, in short actually um, where we learnt about um, uh, these um, characters and um, chaotic characters, strange characters, Lapinov exponents and uh, um, what contributes to the chaotic behavior of a system of differential equations. Um, so, we learned those uh, uh, techniques and uh, the definitions uh, that defines uh, the chaotic behavior of a system of uh, differential equations. Um, this chapter uh, here will start with uh, stiff uh, differential equations and uh, initially we will start with um, single perturbations and uh, we'll learn um, uh, what do we actually mean by that. So, overall idea of this chapter is that uh, you have um, um, let us say a highest order uh, term in a differential equation uh, which uh, has some parameter multiplied to it and we want to analyze the behavior of uh, that differential equation when that parameter goes to 0. Right? Uh, so, in the gist that is that is what we are going to do, but uh, we will learn uh, some uh, cal uh, through some calculations and uh, some results that uh, how these single perturbations and uh, stiff differential equations um, are understood and um, um, we will learn methods to solve them. Right. So, let us start. Um, so, what do we mean by uh, single perturbation? So, let us uh, start with a small, um, uh, a brief uh, motivation behind it. So, consider, so consider a uh, scalar uh, higher order differential equation, higher uh, order. Uh, for the time being, we consider a linear ordinary differential equation ODE, and uh, if we let, if we let the coefficients, the coefficients of uh, the highest order of the highest order or highest term, highest term uh, go to 0, then we obtain basically um, an equation of one order less right of one order less and uh, for that if you have an equation of one order less then in order to solve that you also required one initial condition less right so it depends uh, if you have a first order od then you require uh, one initial condition if you have a second order od then you require two initial conditions to determine the solution uniquely so obviously if you have uh, let's say a parameter multiplied to the highest order term which is basically the second order derivative and if you let that parameter goes to zero then basically the second order term is vanishing and as a result of which uh, you will end up getting a first order OD obviously and uh, to solve that first order OD you will require only one initial condition. So, that is what uh, we mean by this sentence right and now, uh, now if uh, this um, coefficient, coefficient is very small but non-zero is very small that means arbitrarily small but non-zero then what will happen but so that means we are saying that it is arbitrarily small but not tending to zero right non-zero then we may expect then we may expect the solution we may expect solutions of this equation solutions of this equation to resemble to resemble in some way to resemble in some way uh, appropriate solution appropriate solutions solutions of the equation without the highest order term without the highest order term right. 
So, that means uh, instead of letting the epsilon goes to 0, let us say epsilon is that uh, small parameter, um, we are saying that it is arbitrarily small or it is very, very small. So, then basically the solution of this uh, um, equation where you have arbitrary small parameter multiplied to the highest order derivative will resemble uh, to the solution um, of a equation of a differential equation without this highest order term. Right. So, not only when you are letting epsilon tends to 0, but also when you are letting epsilon um, very, very small, but non-zero, then also the, we can expect that the solution should resemble in a, in a way. Right. And uh, how does that resemblance is meant, we will learn, but uh, we expect, we should expect that kind of behavior, because uh, the role of your highest order derivative term is very negligible. Right. So, it should not uh, interrupt the solution of let us say in case of if you have second order OD, uh, it should not interrupt the solution of your first order OD. That means, there is a small perturbation, uh, but that small perturbation is not interrupting the solution of the equation where this highest order derivative is not present. Right. That is what we usually mean by uh, perturbation. That means, you are bringing a small disturbance in the equation, a small addition or whatever way you want to understand that, um, such that uh, due to the presence of that perturbation also, the solution still remains the same or still, still behaves the same, not, not remains the same, but behaves the same. That means, um, it should not become um, um, unstable in a way, right. So, we will see that um, uh, appropriate without the highest order term, but the limit case, uh, but the limit case sorry uh, comma but the limit case but the limit case must have must have uh, a singular behavior a singular behavior that means when we are letting this uh, scale parameter this uh, parameter goes to zero then you are actually talking about some kind of singular behavior right so must have a singular behavior uh, in the sense that in the sense that the solution that the solution of this problem cannot satisfy of this problem cannot satisfy all initial conditions cannot satisfy all initial conditions of the former conditions of the former that means the equation of the uh, equation of the second order so for example suppose if we have epsilon times x double dot plus uh, alpha x dot plus beta x equals to 0 where mod of alpha is very very less than mod of alpha and mod of epsilon is very very less than mod of alpha and mod of beta and uh, x dot x mod of x double dot is not very large is not very large then basically the solution of this equation of uh, let us call it as equation number 1 then the solution then the solution of 1 must or should should uh, resemble resemble a solution of alpha x dot plus beta x that means x double dot is not very large and alpha is arbitrarily small so basically the presence of this alpha times x double dot is actually negligible right so ultimately you are getting a first order od which is alpha x dot plus beta x equals to 0 and uh, therefore we can say we can say that the solution of this equation must resemble with the solution of this equation right and uh, this latter, the the second, the latter equation, the latter equation, which is basically this one, the latter equation is referred as, is referred to as uh, the reduced uh, equation 
corresponding to 1 corresponding to 1 right and uh, in domain where the few definitions we are introducing uh, reduced equation uh, corresponding to 1 in domain where epsilon times x double dot mod is not negligible is not negligible uh, we have a so called layer right so this is called as layer and uh, this is the uh, uh, so this is a transient solution this is a transient uh, this is a transient where let's go to the next page where the solution of equation number 1 rapidly moves to a solution of the reduced equation right to a, to the reduced uh, of the reduced equation the term epsilon times x double dot is called singular is called the singular perturbation of the reduced ODE reduced ODE and such a problem this type of problem occurs very often in uh, electrical circuits um, uh, in case of um, uh, many f physical applications so uh, may also from this uh, uh, oscillations so damped oscillations and all that so there also you can have uh, uh, perturbation problems and um, uh, several other physical uh, uh, physical aspects where you can encounter these kind of uh, perturbation uh, singular per, uh, perturbation type of problem right um, wherever we have this kind of uh, setting uh, for example I mean uh, let us let us uh, look at this um, um, electric circuit problem so example one um, so consider a simple circuit consider we are just we are not going to learn a whole about electrical circuits we just want to write the equation of motion right so for that we need to define few terms so consider a, a simple consider a simple circuit with source vt with source vt uh, constant register R and uh, constant capacitor C, constant capacitor C, right? Um, if we denote, if we denote the current in the circuit by I capital I in fact by capital I and uh, the voltage uh, over the capacitor over the capacitor by U C then I is equals to C times D of U C by D T and uh, for register this is all coming from uh, simple circuit equation and for register uh, we have u r is equals to i times r and uh, therefore from kirchhoff uh, kirchhoff's second law second law uh, some of the uh, some of all voltages in the circuit must vanish right so some of all voltage in the circuit must vanish so therefore this will become dv dt 
equals to um, r times d i d t plus i y c. Let us call it as equation number 2. And suppose, now suppose we have an alternating current, alternating current capital V t which is given by sin t, uh, we define if we define then if we define epsilon is equals to r times c then we find that epsilon times d i d t is equals to minus of i plus c cos t. Right. So, in order to establish whether epsilon terms in the equation is small, the equation should uh, let us call this should be brought into a dimensionless form. So, in order to judge whether there is a dependence on epsilon or not. So, first of all uh, we have to do the non dimensionalization, non dimensionalization means bringing the equation into a non dimensional form and then we see the dependence on epsilon right. So, uh, this is equation number 3. So, we can write um, in order to in order to see in order to see whether the epsilon term in the equation 3 in the equation 3 is small the equation should be non dimensionalized non dimensionalized right non dimensionalized uh, because the technique for non because the technique for the non dimensionalization um, is like you take the initial uh, current and then you divide it by the ref uh, I mean or reference current and then you divide i by i 0 then similarly c by c 0 and all that. So, that non dimensionalization part is not included here and uh, we are also not going to get into the how to do the non dimensionalization. It is just that the idea is that you have a reference uh, uh, concentration uh, reference current or reference uh, capacitor or um, uh, register whatever it is and then you have current i, uh, current r and current c. So, basically you obtain the non dimensional one by dividing i by i 0, r by r 0, c by c 0 and so on. So, when you do the non dimensionalization then we get uh, the, then we get some cancellation in the equation and the, the next equation that you obtain is basically the equation which is in the non dimensional form right. So, that is what we mean. Uh, here we um, we will just write directly how do we get this non dimensional form. So, we uh, read uh, we may read we may read uh, the equation as a non dimensional one as a non dimensional one with c is equals to 1 epsilon very very less than 1 and uh, i is of order 1 right. So, basically we will take so uh, in the following we take c is equals to 1 uh, and uh, we shall provide we shall use i as i epsilon with a subscript uh, to indicate its dependence on epsilon and uh, we also we prescribe we prescribe uh, i epsilon at 0 equals to 0 initially the current was assumed to be 0 and uh, then the solution of what was that equation number 3 right. So, the solution of 3 is given by we can directly write the solution you can find uh, the solution uh, by yourself also. So, i epsilon t is equals to 1 by epsilon 
e to the power minus of t by epsilon integral from 0 to t e to the power s by epsilon into cos of s d of s which is equals to 1 by 1 plus epsilon square uh, cos of t plus epsilon by 1 plus epsilon square sin of t minus um, 1 by 1 plus epsilon square e to the power minus of t by epsilon. We can call this as equation number 4. So, for t greater than epsilon, uh, we see that we see that i epsilon t is equivalent to cos of t that follows from this equation number 4. Right. So, for t greater than epsilon that means the small scaling parameter um, i epsilon t behaves almost like cos of t because epsilon is arbitrarily small. So, what will happen is only cos of t will remain uh, here and uh, rest of the term will simply uh, uh, will not make any um, significant uh, contribution. So, our i epsilon of t will behave like cos of t because epsilon is arbitrarily small. Right? Okay. Now, um, now, what we are going to do uh, if epsilon is uh, note that, so note that the first order OD results results uh, in an algebraic equation algebraic equation after putting epsilon equals to 0, after putting epsilon is equals to 0 with precisely with precisely the solution i 0 t is equals to i 0 t um, equals to cos of t. Yes, I mean if you substitute directly epsilon equals to 0, then this is going to 0, this is going to 0. So, you uh, ultimately obtain uh, the solution as behaving as cos of t. So, it is kind of giving you the idea that uh, if your epsilon is not 0, but actually very, very small, then what happens is your i epsilon of t is actually behaving like uh, cos of t because rest of the two terms, uh, they simply will go towards um, uh, 0 or arbitrary small number. So, they, they will not contribute to i epsilon t at all. Uh, it should be and uh, now uh, also it should be noted also uh, it should be noted that i 0 t is not equals to 0. right? So, when we are substituting uh, epsilon equals to 0 that does not mean that it is becoming 0 for all t. Um, it is actually cos of t uh, which is definitely a non-zero function here um, and uh, therefore, Therefore, the third term, the third term, the third term uh, minus of 1 by 1 plus epsilon square e to the power minus t by epsilon uh, is needed, is needed to describe the transient, the transient part right where where i epsilon rapidly goes rapidly goes from its initial value initial value to the solution of the reduced problem to the solution of the reduced problem of the reduced problem. Uh, clearly, the term epsilon by 1 plus epsilon square sin t does not uh, matter much. matter much for 
epsilon less than 1. Right. Now, if we conclude this, conclude this, then for all t positive limit epsilon tends to 0, i epsilon t is equals to i 0 t for all t. However, for every epsilon positive, we have um, limit t tends to 0, i epsilon t is equals to 0, right? That we can see from the solution itself. Let us go back. So, as t tends to 0, we will have uh, this term as 1 by 1 plus epsilon square, this one will go to 0, second term is minus 1 by 1 plus epsilon square. So, ultimately, um, this solution tends to 0. So, you can see by yourself that for all epsilon, for all epsilon uh, positive, the solution tends to 0 as t tends to uh, 0, but uh, for all epsilon. Uh, for all t positive, when epsilon tends to 0, the solution actually converging to i 0 of t. right? So, this example explains us. So, this example uh, explains us or simply explains, do not write us, explains the terminology, terminology of singular perturbation, singular perturbation perturbation that is i e the limits the limits epsilon tends to 0 and t tends to 0 may not be interchanged not i e uh, also means uh, uh, and can write and and what is happening uh, mm, something is wrong uh, we write at the top and uh, no, this may not be interchanged right interchanged so, this is um, a very nice example which actually explains us what is singular perturbation. Not only that, um, when for all t positive, when we are letting epsilon go to 0, then it is actually converging to our cos state. That means, the current is basically behaving like a cos function, but when we are letting t tends to 0, then our i epsilon of t is going towards 0. right? So, basically if you plot also, so it will look like this. Uh, so, I am not very good in drawing, but I will still try. So, this is uh, i epsilon t and this is our t right? in this direction. So, here you have 2, then 4, then 6 and so on and here we have 0, uh, minus 0.5, then minus 1 and here we have 1. Uh, sorry, is 0 0.5 and then 1 and so on. So, basically it will start like something like this and then there will be a small dip and then it further goes like this, right. So, more or less cost behavior, right. And uh, um, uh, this is our i 0 of t. So, when you are letting epsilon tends to 0, your um, i epsilon actually shows a co cosine behavior. And uh, this is what we um, wanted to uh, show. Also, uh, one more important uh, conclusion, one more important conclusion, one more important conclusion um, from the previous calculation, from the previous derivation is that the singular perturbation problem, perturbation problem, problem exhibit 
exhibit more time scales more time scales slowly varying solution the slowly varying solutions corresponds to corresponds to the slow time scale slow 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 time scale and uh, the fast boundary layer boundary layer solution to fast time scale right so this is an another observation that the singular perturbation problems exhibit more time scale that means uh, the slowly varying solution corresponds to slow uh, time scale and the fast uh, boundary layer problems corresponds to your fast time scales right so this slow time scale fast time scale in the sense um, you have epsilon times di by dt uh, suppose if you have 1 by epsilon then in that case as epsilon tends to 0 then you have fa this this is actually fast uh, um, uh, time scale uh, situation and then uh, this this will lead to a fast boundary layer solution so these things will will encounter further and uh, we'll start our discussion from uh, here um, in the next class and uh, we'll slowly motivate towards uh, stiff differential equations so i thank you for attention and i'll see you in the next class